everybody. I'm uh, Ted Rockwell from the Division of Continuing Education at CU Boulder. Thank you for joining us today on Facebook Live. Today we're having an inspiring conversation about setting yourself up for success as an adult student. My guest today is, has aspirations to become a PhD candidate uh, with big ambitions uh, to return to education after nine years um, doing life and work stuff. So Khalid Allen, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you. Um, so why don't you help us set the stage? Um, who, who are you traditionally as a student? I, I just said that you're aspiring to be a PhD candidate, but uh, that, that's implying that maybe you've been to college already once before. Yeah, um, I went to the University of Chicago in 2005 to 2009. Um, and so my first run through college, I was a psych major. Um, and largely because I didn't really have a particular dream at the time and I was just, psychology had served me very well in high school, my mother was a psych major, um, and psychology seemed like a very useful uh, thing to study. Um, but I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do for my, you know, big dreams. Um, and after college I ended up going into teaching, I was a CrossFit coach for two years, I taught English in Korea. Um, eventually settled in Boulder, got a job as a tutor, and um, taught myself to write code, um, and then decided it was time to pursue my dream of getting a PhD. So that's, yeah, that's the road I got, I went on to get here. <laughs> okay, and so during, during that time you got work as like a computer programmer, coder kind of person? Yeah. Um, did any other people enter into your life during this period? Uh, yeah, I got married. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my wife and I actually met um, the year after she, well, the year she graduated from college, um, and that was only a year after I had graduated. So, and we had also gone to the same middle school and high school, um, but we hadn't started dating until after that. So, um, yeah, we got married in 2016. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Relatedly, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, as an undergraduate, how would you describe who, who you were? How did you approach the work as an undergraduate? And uh, maybe help us understand what that looked like versus how you're approaching it now. Yeah. Um, when I was in high school, I was a straight-A student, and it came pretty easily to me. Uh, and as a result, I never really had to struggle with material that I wasn't familiar with. And I actually sort of internalized the idea that if I was struggling, it was a bit of a problem. Um, I just, I've come to learn that this is called a fixed mindset in academics, and um, it can actually be really problematic. But when I was in, um, in college the first time, I would take hard classes um, in my freshman year. I actually did take Calc 3 in my freshman year of college, but it crushed me. I mean, it was hard. It was harder than anything I'd done in high school. And so I just assumed that I wasn't a math person and decided not to pursue it. Um, and then over the years, you know, this attitude can be kind of a letdown. You know, if you're every time you see something that's really hard and inspiring, you're like, well, I'm just not cut out for that. Um, but luckily, I did run across um, the, some research by a woman named Carol Dweck who um, kind of codified this idea of the fixed versus growth mindset. And I was reading this book and I was found myself, I'm this fixed mindset guy. Um, and so this happened just before my wife and I got married. And by simply understanding that framework, I decided that, you know, I can go back and do something really hard. Um, and so I, you know, have decided to pick the hardest thing I could possibly think of, which um, was math and I mean part of it was I was taking computer classes and I enjoyed the math more So I decided to focus on the math um, But yeah, so now I have this idea of like if it's if it's difficult if it's a struggle, that's fine That's okay. That shows that I'm learning and growing um, And part of this, you know a lot of these lessons I learned from being in fitness as well where you don't get stronger unless you're in there a little pain It shouldn't like you shouldn't break anything, but you know, I was uh, I was also like a runner for a long time and I refused to lift weights, but until I started lifting heavy weights, I didn't actually get stronger. And I learned that um, and then, you know, applying that lesson to academics was a similar process. So, um, so yeah, now I'm, t I'm not afraid to take classes, but it's still a little nerve wracking when you're taking a class that's like way over your head. Um, but I'm a lot more comfortable asking for help than I used to be. 
it's a really kind of amazing personal transformation to kind of realize that about oneself. Yeah. Um, you seem like a unique person in that way. I, a lot of people I know will end up, you know, kind of thinking of themselves as the same throughout time, yeah. basically. Well, that's the, I think that's the key, actually. In high school, first time through college, I thought I was smart. Like, that was my self-definition. I am a smart kid. I am a straight-A student. Um, and I mean, U Chicago is a really good school, and everyone is a smart kid there. Um, and so it was pretty rough where it was like going from being a big fish in a small pond to being a you know, little fish in a much, much, much bigger pond with sharks in it. Um, and so at the end, uh, it was like if, if I was a smart person and I was struggling, there must be something wrong. Um, either something wrong with me or something wrong with the class or something wrong with like maybe this isn't the right course of study for me. Um, I would say that was probably the most brutal aspect of my personality when I was younger because uh, people in my life have always said I'm very willing to grow and change. And so maybe it was the luckily having a little bit of that would to bleed into my idea of my self-identity as a student to help out. So we, I said earlier that you have aspirations to become a PhD candidate in a math field, right? Yes. That's, <clears throat> but but that's towards maybe even a larger goal beyond that. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the one of the big things that inspired me to get back into studying um, and to pursue a degree was when I discovered that um, one of the uh, requirements for being an astronaut is to have a PhD in a STEM field. Well, actually, any degree in a STEM field, um, a PhD gets you past some of the like years of research requirement. Um, and that was always something I dreamed of being. I mean, I remember as a kid drawing pictures of me and my team of astronauts fixing the ozone layer and um, either, you know, saving the world kind of things. Uh, so I had kind of written it off after, you know, I didn't go into science the first time and I didn't end up being a jet fighter pilot, which was a different dream. Um, but then I realized I decided to just look what are the requirements. Um, <laughs> Who would have thought to just check what the requirements are? You're right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it turned out you know you either need ten thousand hours of pilot in command of a jet aircraft, which I wasn't going to get, um, or you have a degree in a STEM field. And um, so that's a big goal. I know the chances of being selected to be an astronaut I have recently discovered are less than being struck by lightning. Um, <laughs> so hopefully. You know, it's they're not correlated because I don't want to get struck by lightning, obviously. <laughs> but um, so it's just something I'm working towards, and uh, you know, having a big goal to motivate me, and even recognizing that it's a small chance is something that I have found very empowering. Um, mm -hmm. So it is a bit intimidating, but you got to try. <laughs> yeah, and so how has You've returned to school after getting actually being out in the world, getting married. Yeah. Um, you've returned to have aspirations to get into the PhD field, uh, mm -hmm. to get a PhD in mathematics, to then have an even bigger goal beyond that. You described yourself as a perfectionist mm -hmm. who's learning how to be a realist. Yeah. How, how are you juggling all these things? It does seem like there's a lot of personal transformation going on at the right. moment. Uh, part of it is that I'm working on letting go of some things. Um, so one of the big shifts from being like a straight A student, smart kid, to being a successful student is that you learn where your boundaries are. So um, I still struggle with this. It was like even I think two weeks ago, I had a math assignment where it was like, it was one of those problems where you're just not going to get it. Like the professor even said, you know, don't work on this more than you're having fun on it. And of course, I understood what she was saying, but I kept kind of banging my head against the wall. Um, although I do enjoy that aspect of math, so it wasn't as bad as it has been in the past where I would just stay up till 2 a.m. until I get something. But that doesn't really help me succeed because it, they didn't even grade that particular problem because no one got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so recognizing that where where your priorities lie. Like some things are more important for me to be successful as a student. Um, I have a routine. I get up in the morning. I go running. I make sure to eat breakfast or something. Um, I get my homework done the day before, not like the night before. I go to bed at a reasonable time. If those things get impinged upon, I become less successful overall. And 
I think when I was younger, there was this attitude of like, you have to win at all costs because there's a lot of stake, your identity and all that. And that wasn't helping me learn. I felt like I was getting through the classes, but I wasn't really absorbing the material. Um, and so balancing that, and then of course now, you know, I, I have to work. Um, it was, I was very lucky in that my parents supported me my first time through college. Um, but I also recognized that you know, if I'm going to do this again, I had that chance. And um, if I'm going to do this again, then I need to look after myself. So I have to work. Um, and I'm married, so I take a lot of the, the responsibilities of the house. We don't live on campus. We don't live in a dorm. So you know, we're cleaning. We're feeding ourselves. We're cooking. Um, and those things I recognize are foundational to my success as a student as well. So it's you know, kind of balancing these. But I've also found, which is kind of counterintuitive, is that like, oftentimes by taking less time from the academics so that I can take care of myself, I do better in the academics. So like, I actually am struggling less this time than I was the first time, even though I feel like I'm not working as hard, I'm just working more deeply, I guess would be a good way to say it. That's remarkable I, and really good advice all the way around. I, I think it took me probably 45 years to realize <laughs> and maybe getting a good night's sleep is a good piece of advice. Yeah, <laughs> took me a while too. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let, maybe we should back up just a little bit. You've, you've uh, decided that you would like to return to school, that you are going to pursue a PhD, but then I, I understand that that wasn't necessarily as straight a shot as you were thinking. Mm. How does continuing education play into all of this, and how have you been using continuing ed to pursue your goals? Yeah. Well, when I started, I mean, I had no idea how I was supposed to get a PhD. And in fact, the first couple of classes I took were at community college, and I was really just taking classes to do something, to like get the ball rolling. And I remember this conversation with my wife where, we were like, well, what do we do? We want to go to grad school. What are we supposed to do? You know, like, we can't start until we have a plan. And after having studied these ideas about being less you know, uptight, it was like, well, let's just go take classes. I'm sure we'll get in the environment and we'll start meeting people. Um, but continuing ed was really helpful at CU because it was a much more approachable uh, entry point. Um, so we were able to reach out to the continuing ed office and they responded immediately. I actually had tried to reach out directly to the departments to get information. And you know, now I'm in the math department, they're really welcoming and they're really friendly. But at the time it was, they weren't the most, like it wasn't that approachable. There was a kind of a sense <laughs> like, well, you're not a student, you're not a math student. Mm, we're not really sure what you're doing here. Um, but continuing ed was very much like, yeah, you know, get them, come into the program, we'll get you in some classes, you can start taking classes with professors, you'll meet the professors, then it'll be a lot easier to talk to the department and talk about moving into a program. Um, so, you know, from a logistical standpoint, I don't know that it makes a huge difference, because technically you can just apply to CU, mm -hmm. but the, the personalities, the welcoming attitude, that was basically what made it. I mean, if we hadn't had that, I don't think, I don't know that we would have been able to proceed as far as we have. Um, so that was actually a really, really valuable part of it. Well, that's excellent to hear. I, I appreciate you uh, sharing your kind experience there. <laughs> um, you say we, um, and, and I, I'm assuming that you're talking about your wife as well. Are yeah. There, is it, she's going back to school as well? She is. Um, it was kind of a joint thing that we did. After, like right before we got married, we decided to go back to school after we got married. Um, that would be our thing. So she'd always been interested in astrophysics, um, and my interest has been largely in math um, or computer science or a combination. And so when I decided, or when we, when she decided she really wanted to go back for a PhD, um, I decided that was also a good time to you know look into that and to start taking steps in that direction. Did she have any interaction with continuing ed? She did. Um, yeah, she met with the same advisor I did. Um, and has actually gone pretty much the same path. Okay. Um, she took some classes at continuing at first, and then she um, is now applied as a student. Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear if anyone who's tuning in has any questions for Khalid and his experience in engaging continuing ed. Obviously, this is at a maybe a different level than many people may be thinking they see themselves in, but it's a common story of, hey, I'd like to get started again. I'm not quite sure how. 
Um, it sounds like you may have you know some insight on what that looks like. Um, so if yeah, if you have any questions out there, go ahead and you know send them on in. We'll we'll find them and and make sure that we uh, answer them here. Um, so I understand that there's some you've you've examined some specific tactics mm. on how to improve academic performance. Yes. And uh, I would love to have you talk a little bit about how you have learned how to study more quickly. Yeah. Uh, partly because I'm cramming for <laughs> a, a variety of performance evaluations and budget <laughs> hearings that are coming up. But That's fair. <laughs> seriously, yeah. No, what, what, what sorts of insights do you have to share around studying? Well, so first I want to give some context. Um, there's, when I was in high school and first time in college, uh, because I was a successful student and it came very easily, I didn't develop very many study tactics or habits. Um, I was blessed with a pretty good memory and I you know, had grown up around my dad who's a programmer. So I had been exposed to a lot of problem solving and things like that. So I was like really good at high school stuff. Um, and then in college, as long as it was within a sort of learning that I was familiar with, I was fine. Um, so coming back to school, recognizing A, that I had this, I didn't really know how to study. It was weird. I was thinking about it. I was like, well, I was so good in high school. What would I do to study? And I couldn't come up with anything. Um, recognizing that, recognizing that I'm married and that I need to prioritize my time. And like, if I can't waste time doing hours and hours and hours of studying if it's not going to be efficient because there's just no way I'm going to get through it. And I didn't want to you lose, I didn't want to like not sleep as that was not okay. I'd done that. I didn't want to do it again. Um, so I made a kind of a program of figuring out like what are the useful study tactics. And um, I'm going to throw out a name because this guy has really like, uh, I wish I had seen him the first time I went through. Cal Newport has a bunch of books on how to be successful as a college student. Um, he himself was a successful college student, but he's, he wrote a blog called Study Hacks and several books that have specifically focused on you know, improving your study habits and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I followed a lot of his strategies and techniques. Uh, so a good example of a very straightforward one is um, e like um, re repetition. It sounds kind of silly, but like um, in math, for example, we'd write a lot of proofs. And there's this, when I first approached it, I was like, oh, well, this is just a, you know, I have to understand this so I can reproduce the proof. Um, but what I started doing was actually rewriting it repeatedly um, and then kind of getting it into muscle memory. Um, and I found that helped me understand it, but it was also a much faster way to study instead of like reading my notes, trying to remember them, reading them, kind of not really getting anywhere. Now what I'll do is I'll ignore my notes and just write the proof and then check. And if I got it right, I get it right, cool. If not, I'll just start over and write what I tried to remember from my notes. And so it's very, very fast. It's like I can do, you know, in maybe 10 minutes, I can memorize a proof that would have taken me like an hour to do before. Hmm. Um, I studied the, a lot of pedagogical techniques. So Barbara Oakley has this course, um, I think it's now like the most popular massively online learning thing uh, called Learning How to Learn. Uh, she has a book as well. Originally, it was called A Mind for Numbers, but it was basically this concept on the psychology and neuroscience of learning. Um, so I learned about letting a problem simmer in your mind. So now what I do instead of trying to just hammer through a problem is I will try to start as early as possible, just a little bit, not like I don't have to do the whole thing. But I'll see a problem, I can think about it, and then I can just let it sit because your brain has this has two systems. Um, one of them is for focused approaches to problems, and one of them is diffuse learning. Um, and when you're working and you're consciously thinking about something, you can't really be very creative because our brains just aren't wired that way. They like you're looking at a you know tiger on the savanna, and it's all you need to deal with. Um, but if you're trying to think about ways to like, I don't know, maybe find creative ways to get around a tiger on a savanna. You don't want to be dealing with the one right in front of you. You want to be like dreaming about it or thinking about it, I guess. Um, so diffuse thinking has helped me solve a lot of math problems that I was totally stuck on. I've actually saved a lot of time that way just by, you know, starting a problem and then going for a run and then in the middle of the run suddenly I'll have an answer. Um, and 
I've come to trust this enough that I can just rely on it. Like this is part of my system. It's not just a lucky break. It's start a problem, go do something else, you will solve the problem. Um, it so sounds to me a little bit like um, your, your prior experience as an undergrad in psychology has really affected uh, yeah. <laughs> your approach to things, right? Yeah, it has a lot actually. Um, it's, I still find it very valuable, certainly. I don't want to diminish the value of my psych degree. Um, and I actually encourage people in general, like psychology I think is one of the most useful subjects to know. Because it's just, it's how your brain works, it's how you think, it's how you interact with other people. Um, and so you can always apply it to anything. Anything you're trying to learn, if it's a struggle, you can say, well, what's the psychology behind this? Um, so I find that really helpful. Yeah, it's, well, and I, both of those principles seem easy to remember, right? It's yeah. uh, the first one is just try to write it yourself yes. to see if you're remembering the content appropriately. Yeah. And then the next one is to envision, um, you know, start start the problem, kind of envision it while you're doing other things yeah. and then come back to the problem and see if you can solve it. Yeah. yeah. So I've, and then kind of just the attitude of like, get your hands dirty. Um, I think when I was a high school student, I didn't always feel the need to work so much with the material because I could usually figure it out on the test. Um, and now I make a point of like getting involved with the problem, getting engaged with the material, and making sure I can do it. So like I'll get practice exams or I'll make practice exams for myself, and then I'll just go through it once, check myself, go through it again, check myself until I can basically do it perfectly. Um, that's, that's excellent. I, I'm seeing questions come in, so I'm slightly distracted on your answers. And I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions coming in from our audience. Sure. I'm also going to let you know your mom's watching. Hi, um, Mom. Nice. Um, hey. <laughs> Psychology. Yeah, she's the inspiration for that. <laughs> so uh, here's a question of pretty basic. How do I get started with a continuing, a continuing education advisor? Yeah. Uh, well, we just emailed the continuing ed office. We just went on uh, CU Boulder's website. I think we Googled continuing ed CU Boulder. Um, and there's a link to contact an advisor. Um, yeah. Ours was Graham. He reached out to us really quickly. and uh, that was Do you remember if your initial conversation was via phone or did you come, show up in person? It was, oh, well, we emailed. I'm an email person. I don't like calling people on the phone. Um, but yeah, we emailed and then they invited us to come in and we had a conversation and it was very relaxed. Like we didn't know what we were doing. We had no idea. We had no plan really. Um, but he helped us figure out what the plan would be and he explained what our options were. Um, so that was, he's actually helped set our, like he was the one who helped set our uh, path this whole time. So definitely a good way to start. Thank you, Graham. Um, let's see, what, here, here's a good question actually that I think just about anyone could use even outside of school, but just mm. life tips. <laughs> uh, what do you do if a life event conflicts with an exam or your classwork? You sound like a very structured individual, yeah. so how do you deal with disruptions in your flow? Um, I haven't had a huge number of conflicting events, largely because I've decided to prioritize my degree, and so um, I won't schedule big events around it. Um, recently, we did have a, we had a trip book to London that I forgot. I didn't really check the dates really well on, <laughs> and it was like right before spring break, so it would have been during a midterm. Uh, we ended up just deciding not to go, um, which was a little bit rough. Um, luckily, it was through a deal, so it didn't cost us a ton of money, but it was still not trivial. Um, a lot of it was like I knew what my priorities are and that's kind of how I operate. I mean obviously if it was an emergency with family or with my, with my wife then that would take priority. Um, we, I, when I was working full time last semester um, I did have some business trips that I needed to do and I was lucky that my professor was willing to work around them. Um, I did have one homework that I basically just sandbagged because there was no way I was getting it done. Um, and I was in Florida for a, it was actually at a NASA event. Um, so yeah, I was like, do I want to participate in this NASA rover building competition or do I just want to get this <laughs> random homework assignment done? It was obviously the NASA thing. Um, and I mean, I just, I got like half credit on that assignment, but you know, it was one of, I think, 18 or something for that for the semester so it wasn't a big deal um, 
I think a lot of it just comes down to knowing what your priorities are. Like, I, if I know what my priorities are, I don't feel bad about turning down other life events. Um, and, you know, being a student is nice because you get spring break, you get fall break. Um, so you actually get a lot more time off than you would if you were working a regular job. Um, but, yeah. It's, Sounds like you have a lot going on, and there's a yes. lot to your schedule. And prioritization yeah. helps as a word and an idea, but reality is reality. And so what tips do you have for people who may be thinking that they're going to get in, but they realize there's going to be a lot to juggle? Yeah. How do you stay motivated while, while you're dealing with all of these things? I think that's actually a good question. The motivation thing is probably the most important. I mean, if you have motivation, I've discovered if I am motivated, nothing else is going to stop me. Like, I can work late, I can stay up late, I can, you know, juggle class assignments and cook dinner and keep the house clean and spend time with my wife. Um, but if, and for me, like, staying motivated is part of my process. It's not just something I kind of hope and am inspired by. It's like, um, I w one of the things I, I do is, you know, I, I go running even in the cold, and sometimes that's what makes it better. Like, I get up, I'm out in the cold, I've done a run, and the day hasn't even started yet. And so, like, no matter what happens, I've got that. And that makes me feel really motivated. Um, I also like to imagine myself in astronaut training because, you know, astronauts have to be in great shape. Um, having that big goal for me is also really valuable. Um, part of it is, um, like, having those life practices that keep you motivated so that you feel strong and confident about yourself. Um, part of it is having a goal in mind. So like just the day-to-day -day motivation is great, but then knowing that I'm aiming for this awesome goal, I'm aiming, you know, if I want to be an astronaut, it's going to be hard. And so also shifting, that's actually a good one, shifting the framework. So like something is hard, that's good. Um, I used to think something was hard, it's not good, and that's the problem. But now it's like, if this is hard, that's awesome. You know, it means that there are going to be fewer people who are going to be willing to put up with it. It means that I'm growing, I'm sharpening myself, and I'm becoming stronger. Um, and so that it, a lot of it is just like playing these mind games. Again, it's psychology. Um, I play a lot of mind games with myself to stay motivated. And some people are like, well, that's weird. You're kind of manipulating yourself or deluding yourself. But we all sort of delude ourselves. And if you're thinking like, oh, I'm no good at this, or I don't have time for this, that's a delusion too. Um, so I try to pick the motivating delusions, I guess. So for people who are not Khalid Allen, who wants to be an astronaut, who's playing mind games with themselves, who needs to motivate <laughs> themselves, what, what would you say to someone who is interested in pursuing education? What, do you, what yeah. are you understanding about education that maybe others do not? Um, I think that a lot of people view education as a reflection of who they are. Um, and I think like if you're good at something or if you are a math person or you're not a math person or if you're smart or you're not smart. And I think if you just think of it as a skill that takes practice, uh, it can be, um, it can help motivate you because it takes a lot of the pressure off. Um, and it also helps empower you because it makes you more effective. Um, it is something that can just be worked on. Like if you learned how to drive a car, you can learn how to do proofs in math, or you can learn how to analyze a Jane Austen novel, or you can learn the physics equations you need to solve problems. It's like it's any skill that needs practice. Um, and to not take it personally, um, like I do a lot of tutoring on the weekends, and so a lot of times I'll get students who don't think they're good at something, and they'll beat themselves up over a mistake on an SAT or an ACT. And you know, I tell them like, this isn't. Don't take this personally. It's just reflection. It's just feedback. Um, and so that's a good way to think about it. Well, we've we've come to half an hour here. Okay. This, <laughs> this seems like it was five minutes long, Khalid. It's thank you. Fantastic to talk to you. Really inspired by your story, and wish you all the best moving forward. Thank you. I'm sure you, you're not going to need continuing education as you start getting into your PhD program. But if you ever do, we're always here for you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, thank you all for tuning in for this Own Your Journey conversation. Uh, join us again for another live event. And uh, make sure to tune into our YouTube page where we have all of our Own Your Journey conversations for you to view at your leisure. Thank you.